All right, welcome in another edition of the Ryan and Goodman podcast. Uh, he is Bob Ryan. I'm Jeff Goodman, and we have a great guest for you today. None other than eight-time NBA All-Star Dave Cowens, two-time NBA champion, uh, MVP in 1973. Dave, uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I want some good stories, not only of you on this podcast, but I'd like a good Robert Ryan story as well <laughs> of, of how he was back in the day when he had to cover you guys. So I'm expecting a really good one, a flammable one at some point. You can start it off now. I, try to think. He, was, he was bipartisan. He was bipartisan. <laughs> we know that. I was caught in the middle of the players and the coach on occasion, as Dave knows. <laughs> that was for sure. And Dave, by the way, uh, let's not bury the lead and Hall of Famer. And Hall of Famer, that's right. Hall of Famer. That, that one's just understood. You know, I, you got all those stats. Listen, you got all those stats. And yet, Bob, um, you know, uh, trying to be a first ballot Hall of Famer the first time you're optional, you know, it's there was, there's not been a whole lot of them. And some of the guys that didn't get it or should be, should have gotten it. Yeah. You know, if you look, I don't know how they worked it, but. Well, I'll tell you, the problem with the difference in, you know, like in the baseball, everybody knows you, it's the Baseball Hall uh, Writers Association. Uh, there's 500 plus people depending on voting, uh, and it's right. essentially the ba basketball Hall of Fame are rotating committees, three year terms of 24 so, people. I've done it twice. And don't you have to have somebody um, get do some paperwork and some background to nominate them? Yes, it's back. It's a, there's a nominating a class. Former well. Hall of Famer. I've been a part of that too. And uh, yes, they need nominations officially, and right. then goes to a nominating committee. Right. And, and then the nominating committee, you know, gives the names to the, to the uh, voting committee. And now, right. now in the strange, I was a part of both of them at the same time, the last time I did it, which I thought was kind of, I don't know, I just thought that was a little strange. I was fine, happy to do it. But, you know, I think if you're, you nominate and send it on, it shouldn't be the same people, you know, with, with, but I was actually in both of them. Anyway, you do need a, an official nomination. And, uh, right, you do. Now, Johnny Most is in the Hall of Fame or not? You know is he what? a contributor? Is he? He's not yeah. like Chick Hearn, though, right? Well, well, they should be on the same level, you know. I'm not there, I don't think Johnny's. Got I don't think he is yet. Chick was a part of the. Of course, Chick was also a, technically a, a member of the Lakers organization. He was a. He had a title as well as what well. Johnny was never, you know, in the front office. Chick was actually technically in their organization at at, at, at times. Um, so he was a bigger uh, homer than uh, Johnny. <laughs> not really. <laughs> He was – his calling card was, 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 was uh, being – playing it down the middle of times. He criticized the Lakers. I, I, I can promise then he, you that. Well, then he knew something on management. If they didn't play to his <laughs> satisfaction, you know, artistically, they heard about it on the air. Who's, who's the me. biggest homer, the, the biggest TV radio announcer homer you've ever uh, heard, Bob? Is there something? Uh, Johnny was – Johnny set the standard. I mean, you know, and, and I'll tell you something. And That's why a, he should be in the Hall of Fame. He Dave liked it until Dave showed up. See, I think Dave was a dividing line in Johnny Most's personal uh, history. Uh, Johnny Most, when I first came on the scene as a, a listener, as a freshman at BC in 1964, and I discovered Johnny Most, he was a highly partisan announcer, but he called a really good, solid game, embellished with his Celtic you know, partisanship. He gave some credit to other players. For example, Jerry West, who we love. After Dave showed up, and, 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 I, I, and that, that, from then point on, I don't know, that team was the good guys and the bad guys and the black hats and the white hats every single night. It was a passion play from that point on. And, and it never, he never looked back. And he still was a good announcer in terms of calling out the picks and calling out the play, but it gave way to the sheer – uh, passion play that he created for the listeners every single night. And I think the well, turning point was when you showed up, David, in 1960. He, but like you're saying, he, he, he made listen to the game. You knew what was going on because he had that professionalism to him, but he had a hell of a lot of flair. Oh, he sure did. I mean, well, the stuff he did while he was announcing, you know, setting himself on fire and spilling coffee and oh, yeah. you know, catching all, his teeth when they fell out and having a – Having a thing in his ear that he couldn't hear anybody. <laughs> all true. All part of the Johnny Most lore, no question. Uh, you know, and, and, and traveling crazy. with him was a, 
I once roomed with him one night during your exhibition season in 1970. You're rookie. You room with him? And one night we got, uh, there's a room shortage and, uh, and, and, <laughs> two, and we actually roomed together. And I talked to him at length into the night and it, a very interesting man, you know, oh, very yeah. bright. Uh, and, you know, he's very smart, very bright. Uh, you know, away from the basketball. No, yeah. But boy, hey, did was, he ever? Did he ever play for um, Bear Bryant? He went to Alabama. Uh, he said he played football for Bear Bryant. Yeah, well, he went, I don't know. I don't think he could have played. I, I, he also <laughs> booked the college. He's an awful but, small yeah, guy. He had, a split, he had a split college career because of the war. He was. He was a. He was a. a, a I think he was a navigator for a bomber in World War II. Okay. And uh, then he came back in and after he had been to Brooklyn College, he, he wound up at Alabama or vice versa. I oh, mean, yeah, he used to tell doubt, us about but that. But Bear wasn't the coach then anyway. You never would have played for Bear. Bear was oh, later, okay. trust me. I think the guy's name was Wallace Wade, but we can look that up. He was and, on the touch football team. Anyway. Right. But, <laughs> Dave, I, got, I got to tell you a story. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to tell a day <laughs> you want to, uh, that this is uh, – we so we were he's a rookie and, and we were in El, El, Elmira, New York, Horseheads, New York, as a matter of matter of fact. They're playing the Buffalo Braves expansion team. And David, uh, we go to lunch. He's not going to remember this, but we go to lunch and we're sitting around talking, talking, talking. We eat lunch and now it's like the middle of the afternoon, and uh, they says, "Well, it's time for dinner." <laughs> so you know, we never left. David had two meals. He had the lunch and the dinner before we left that motel. I mean, we left that restaurant. Uh, I, I just remember that one, David. How was the relationship different? You know, you hear about it all the time, and I'm 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 nearing fifty. Um, but but the relationship between media and, and players has changed so much, way more now today than it ever was because you got social media now. So the players don't need the media at all. They can put out exactly what they want and get their message out that way. But what was it like when when you played, Dave? Did you trust the media more than obviously it looks like the current day players trust the media now? No, you know what happened? It's almost like the, the, you say today's players don't need the media, but they want it because they got a brand to sell. They got a website. They got a blah, 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 blah. In my day, we didn't want to have anything to do with the media. <laughs> they were, we considered them fortunate to be lug them along for lunch and stuff like that. <laughs> well, you did a lot of it. Oh, give me the, give me a break on that one. You know better than that. <laughs> uh, you know better than that, Dave Collins. But no, but it was a. Uh, it no, was, but we didn't. Uh, we didn't go out and, and and try to. I don't know. It was it was a different relationship. It was almost like we were equals. Yeah. So you could bust everybody's balls, and nobody got a big whatever about anything. It was like. You know, and, and because they knew a lot about us and we knew some stuff about them. So, you know, what goes on the road stays on the road. And when you <laughs> develop a close relationship like that, you're in airports and cabs and hotel lobbies and gyms and all that stuff. Well, you, you know, a lot the best of us comes out. Right. The I mean, best you, of us. You were, you were traveling more together because there weren't as many private planes, um, all that. You and. Know. You know, again, social media. I think. Is well, do beat writers do beat writers go on the planes today? No, never. no, no. So see that, that, that we all went, to, you know, commercial. So we were flying the same plane. Bob would come down the aisle. He's sitting in coach. He'd have about twenty five newspapers in his hand. <laughs> I could read newspapers. Remember playing cards? Casino was the big game. Remember? Hank Spinkle. Card lays and card play. Card, right, card lays and card play. And Joe Delory was big on that one, too. And he didn't it, buzz from that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Hank Finkel. Let's talk about Hank. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, Hank Finkel. People, uh, he came in the news a little bit last week because Dan Shaughnessy called him up to talk about following Bill Russell and what it's going to be like for whoever yeah, has to follow Bill I read that Wade. article. He told me to read it, yeah. Yeah. So, which, so it's the, what, how, what, it's, what memories did it stir for you about Hank? Well, I called up Hank and I talked to him about it. I said, how'd you like it? And, you know, and uh, me, he, he was happy with it. He didn't have any problems. That's the way it was, you know. He said, oh, it's all, it was all about this guy who's coming in to try to replace um, um, Brady. Brady. That guy, yeah, Brady. Yeah, that guy, number 12. That, that yeah. guy. <laughs> He's a pretty good player. <laughs> Dave, who, who was the, the <coughs> player? Um, What'd you say? Who was the toughest player you ever had to guard? Who was, who was the guy you just, you know, again, you were known as obviously for your toughness, for your versatility, all that. But was there somebody that you just didn't want to go up against that you were overmatched? Yeah, I got a long list of those. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Um, 
you know, when you get Jabbar one night, then you get Reed, then you get Thurman, then you get, you know, Alcindor, then you get Chamberlain, then you get Bellamy, and then you get, I mean, Walton in there a little bit. Then you get, Unsold. Uns, oh, I'm so Hayes. And then you go to the power forwards. You got Hayes and Johnsons and all those guys. So, you know, every night was a battle. And, you know, but I just tried to bring whatever I had that night. You know, you give them the best of you. You know, that's what you want to leave them with, the best of you. And um, so I tried to do. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. Well, let's tell people that uh, the Dave Cowens of the rookie uh, – most of the time when he shook hands and, and when they did at midcourt before they threw that ball up your rookie year, it was the first time you ever saw those guys play. Cause you were not a big fan. You were not, a, you were a doer. You were not a big fan in college. You weren't, it was through, whatever it was TV not. was available, you weren't watching. So there wasn't any who, TV. How am I going to watch it if I don't have a TV? All right. You guys, so these guys <laughs> were boomers, right? I mean, there were only like how many games on TV? One a, one a week? Sunday, right, one a week, Sunday. Yeah. And usually it was the Celtics. So there were rumors, right? And I mean, well, I know you told me at the time that you would say to me, show me what you got. I yeah. thought, I remember some, you, you know, because you'd only played them a couple times a year. They were, but I, I don't, I just Until thought. Until he got to Cleveland, he was, he was yeah. in middle, he was in Chicago. Yeah, right, right, well, that's right, later on. But when he was in Golden State, Tickway, he was really in his prime. Right. You know? Who was I mean, the yeah. guy with him, Lee? Didn't he have a powerful? Clyde Lee. Powerful kind of with Clyde like Alvin Adams. Yeah. Kind of an Alvin Adams kind of built guy. Okay, from Clyde Lee. Yeah. Or Vanderbilt, right? Yeah, Vanderbilt. Yeah, absolutely. So he was a good player. I mean, when you look back, good Dave, when you look back at that, um, I, I once did a story in the centers in, in both the ABA and NBA in 1970 71. You named all those names. And then you could go over to the hey, ABA and it how was. How about I, I never liked playing against him. I know. And I'll tell you a story, Dave. Um, that guy, he's small. I mean, one of the most unorthodox kind of shooters you would think, you know. Flipped and, it, right? That huh? to his. He flipped it. Like well, he, well, he, the thing is, his approach is he came down like this. Like some guys do, they got a little motion, but they're so good at it, you know, they keep their distance and you can't bother them. But um, Alex English was a little bit like that. Okay. And Mac yeah, didn't that kind of delivery. He didn't need much room to get that shot up either, did he? I mean, he, he didn't. You, but he was so uh, quick, you know, and he, boom, like, like that. So when I tried to guard him, he was killing me. They were running picks for him, going, he's supposed to set picks on me. I'm the guy that's <laughs> supposed to, you know, guarding the guy. And pretty soon they switched it around. And now he's coming off and hitting. So I used to tell Silas or even Havlicek, why don't you guard him? And I'll guard Hurd or somebody like that you know, on the Schluter or somebody, whoever else was out there playing with him. And, um, but you know, he was a good player on that team, Bob Kaufman, early on. With oh, the, yeah, well, uh, yes. Uh, you, I remember Bob one Kaufman very interesting good. evening in Buffalo, you and Bob Kaufman. Yeah, Kaufman. Uh, yeah. He, I went down to his camp that summer, you know, down at Guilford. Well, for people who don't know, I'm going to tell the quick uh, abridged version. I'm covering this game, and after, you know, the way I covered the game, you know, I had a running sheet, basketball we scored, I'd write so-and-so. And, you know, and I got the, the shorthand down. So a basket was scored, folks, and I'm right. All of a sudden I hear this smack of flesh against flesh. And I look up, and there are these two guys are standing at the free throw line. The other eight guys are running to the other end of the court. And Dave is standing there with his arms down as if to say, okay, your turn. He is just exactly, popped, I told him that. He just popped Kaufman. Now he puts his arms down like some Russian lumberjack, you know, ready to drink the vodka. And he says, okay, your turn. And he pops Dave. And what oh, was yeah. all over, you had an eye patch, and he had, oh. like, teeth loosened. Oh, yeah, I had. I played uh, against him a few <laughs> nights later, and I played with his big cut and a shiner in the Celtics game. <laughs> I know. I can see you came into the Globe office for something, Dave, and I, with that shiner. I can still remember it. I don't know what the hell that was all about. Yeah. But the he hit me was, right here and cut me right here, so I had to get. But you know what? I don't, the funny thing, I had to go in the locker room because I was bleeding. I don't think they kicked us out of the game. Oh, that was 1972. <laughs> that was like, are you kidding? I don't even know. They call a foul. Who get the foul on? You both. How you be? How many games would you get? How many games would you be suspended for for that? Ten. Today. Yeah. I have to suspend both of them. Right. You know, I'm probably you know good, good ten, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, but I mean, this like this was. Hey, it's about twenty-five million dollars, right? 
<laughs> I mean, I, there are we we don't have enough time for all the good all the Dave Cowan stories. It'll have to be part two. Hey, that, you know, I was my, that's to, one of my favorites. Hey, do you remember? I I don't know if I dreamt it. I'm pretty sure I did it <laughs> in Portland. Um, there was I saved the ball. The answer's yes. Huh? Go ahead. The answer's yes. I was, and, uh, <laughs> I was talking to Johnny Davis the other day because he played for them in guard with Walton. And um, I said, I think it was you. I saved the ball down on our end where, our, you know, the, our team's bench was on the left of the box of the scoring table when you look at it. And so I saved it, and I jumped over the chairs out of bounds. And then I ran up that aisle between the fans and behind the press and up the other thing and got in on the court and was involved in a fast break. <laughs> that is the gospel truth, people. And huh? it's like you picture uh, the car and the train and that, you know, like driving along. Uh, at that picture, a car driving alongside railroad tracks and a train. <laughs> next to it. He so you right remember that. Right that there. happened. It's what, Dave, I got, I'm the repository of Cowan's Law. You're not going to slip any by me. I can tell you right now. You're absolutely right. That I just happened. wanted to verify. I didn't know if it actually happened. It did. You didn't dream it. It, it happened. I'm telling you, I'm, it's one of my, it's just one of the many good Cowan stories. I ran a really wide lane, Bob, I was a real <laughs> wide one. <laughs> uh, oh God, no, that's, that's, that's one of my absolute favorites, it's true. I went back up a little bit, because uh, uh, Jeff's got a great uh, contemporary uh, understanding of the way the game is evolved today, the way kids are recruited, the way kids are formed, uh, how the process is, the developing adolescent ball players. Uh, it's his job, you know, and, and, he, and he knows this stuff. Uh, Tell me what a summer was like for Dave Cowens in both high school and college. What was a summer like? Well, in high school, um, <clears throat> in high school, I didn't really work in the summer. I had, you know, paper routes and stuff like that. And we'd work, I'd work a little bit at a corner grocery store for a while and get enough dollars to gather to buy, you know, some candy and soda pop and stuff like that. Just wanted to play all the time. But when I got to college, I ended up, you know, working um, different jobs in the summertime. I'd work at a place called Velvachine, who they, they print out the sweatshirts and T-shirts, got all the little stuff on it, the paint and everything. So, you, you know, bringing boxes into the area, unloading the trucks and then sorting stuff in the shelves so that guys can, the printers can get it. And then you, go and clean the screens that all the ink was on. The only thing they didn't let me do is uh, output. Everything was there, just supply. I was part of the supply chain. Okay. <laughs> well, back in high school, do you That like was one. And then I did the iron workers. And so I used to get to climb up on buildings and they helped me. I could do connecting the big uh, beams one to the other. Oh, yeah. You get a thing like that and you whack them in, you put the big bolts in and tighten them up and then you shimmy up or walk out on these beams and you might be eight floors up, nothing below you, but you know, more metal. It was a pretty cool, you know, experience to meet some of these iron workers who they go all over the world, in, over the, the country, wherever the job is. They're like nomads, they're yeah. all over the place. Yeah, yeah. There's a name for them. They got a nickname, I think, for their fraternity. And then it was manpower. So you get a buck 40 an hour to go pick rocks out of a hill or take carts out of a shopping mall or wash windows in a, a, a nunnery or something. <laughs> <laughs> How did you now, back in high school, did you have regular pickup games? Or was there a regular routine, or did you just go search? Well, we, in the summertime, we played baseball and basketball. Oh, you played baseball. Ran, ran around in, in the woods and all that stuff. So we okay, were always yeah. up and down. So, so Very yeah. no <laughs> AAU ball. No, none of that stuff, Jeff. Your Florida State recruiting. No, we used to have the one thing we played four. We had um, a catcher, a pitcher, and two fielders. Yes. And you could only hit it to one side. Yeah, I grew up that way. That kind of stuff. So we I try to that invent way. little games, you know. Yeah, that's funny. That's what right. we did. Dave, did, did Florida State recruit you based on your high school games completely? And there was no, no such thing as AU or summer ball? Well, I only played my junior and senior year in high school. So the only time probably Durham saw me play or anybody saw me play was probably my senior year for the most part, because we had a really good high school team, uh, Newport Catholic and all boys, about 800 all boys. So it was, and we played in the GCL, which was the Greater Cincinnati League. So we would play with a lot of schools like Moeller and Bacon and Purcell and Elder, which big football, you know, football, football down there. 
but good basket, all boys schools, one of those kind of routine. Plus, we were we qualified to play all the teams in Kentucky. So we would go play some mountain team, Inez, Kentucky. You know, they were lucky to have 25 kids in the whole school, but they had a basketball team. They won the state championship with one year's mountain town. And then the same trip, you go over and play an all-black school in Louisville, Dunbar, or something like that. And you go up and you play in your region most of the time. So it was nice to play in um, Louisville Invitational Tournament. And then we had districts and regionals and stuff like that. But we were 20, what was it, 20, 29 and 3 is what um, our senior year. How big were you coming out of high school? How big were you when we, Durham, you, Durham recruited you? I was 6'6", six, six, weighed 190. And what did you play at? What did you play at for the Celtics? 6'9", 235. 35. Yeah. So between my freshman year going into college and, and graduating four years later, I grew three inches and gained 45 pounds. Wow. And that's what I stayed at for the most. Huh? Was that for you or, or, or the weight program that Florida State had? They didn't know weight program. <laughs> they did nothing. Weight program. I didn't. They they didn't do nothing, man. I mean, you had to push yourself you to yeah. get strong. So I figured it out. There was a guy. We stayed in an athlete, a combined athlete and student body dorm, and so they had a little closet of a weight room in the in the bottom of it. The football team was there, baseball, swimmers, everybody, plus other students. Then girls were eight stories right on the other side. And um, so I went down there in this little weight room. It had a little TV in it, but it had some things coming out of the wall. It had a bench and dumbbells, um, no bikes, no cardio equipment, and then some barbells and all that stuff. So there was a guy, a muscle, muscle bound guy in there. So I asked him, I said, What do you think? I like to build up my upper body. My legs are fine. I just like to get a little bit bigger up here. So he, kind of taught me how to lift properly, you know, the sort of the strategy and not going too fast and not really heavy and, you know, a lot of repetitions and then kind of build up gradually, that kind of stuff. So it was, um, and that's when I started and I did it in the summers only. And then when the season started, we just played. But that was, but that was, and I did it every summer. So I would go to work, say I'd go to the iron workers from, you know, be there at seven o'clock and work until four thirty. And I go to a, um, a place called the Fenwick in Cincinnati, and um, <clears throat> um, I would work out. They had a nice shower. They had a weight room in there and all that stuff, so I could do that. So I did that three days a week after work. And I go back to the house where I'm living with mom and dad and brothers and sisters, and um, eat a little something, take a nap, go out, drink a lot of beer, get up. You know, go to bed about one o'clock and get up at six and go to work again. <laughs> you work know, hard, play hard, right? Well, you know, I mean, it's the hell you're young, you can do it. You were the fourth pick of the 1970 draft. Uh, what was draft day like then? Draft day, you know, of course, this year all bets are off, but ordinarily draft day be a huge extravaganza. TV, <laughs> guys invited in, green rooms, you know, shake hands with the commissioner, huggy, huggy, hat. Blah, blah. Yeah. 1970. What, was it, what were you doing on draft day, and how did you find out you were drafted by the Boston Celtics? Well, you know, they had the ABA thing going on then, too. Yes. So they had their own draft, and um, <clears throat> and there was a thing about we are going to stay with the Floridians, when they're going to go to the L.A. Stars. Bob Sharman was coaching at the time, and um, or through the NBA, and I didn't know anything who was going to draft me in the NBA, but I said, I want to go to the NBA. That's what I've been watching. That's what I know. I want to, you know, I want to go there. So pretty much the decision was made for me that I was going to go with the NBA. And it's funny back then, uh, you know, lawyers couldn't have, couldn't contact somebody on their own that wanted to represent a player. So they had to get a, an agent that maybe ran a dry cleaning store or something like that. And he'd go and he'd be the guy that would go out and reach out to the college players mm -hmm. and try to get them signed. But all those guys, it was funny, the relationship, all those agents, either those, all their players either went to the ABA or they went to the NBA. Now, is that a coincidence or were they getting something on the other side from, yeah. from the NBA itself, you know, which you weren't supposed to be doing. Anyway, um, 
So we um, had no, let's see, I think I was in the gym, Bob, and I was going down to change and go get a workout. I knew the draft and something was going on, and um, some kid yelled to me, hey, you just, you got drafted by the Celtics. I go, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So then I go in, I, I wasn't going to go in and talk to Durham. Hugh Durham, I think he was in the office. And, um, and then we just talked about it a little bit. And then I had some, it was some guy at Florida State that was a business professor. And he, he contacted me, said, oh, you know, can I negotiate for you and all that? I said, I don't know, but I went up to New York and met this other guy, um, Bob, Bob Blass, and um, just got with him. And one of the best things about going with him, first of all, he only charged 5%, not 10. Like <laughs> Plus, they threw in an accountant, the guy named oh, yeah. Ira Levy. And, um, oh, man, he, he taught me a lot. You know, he was a good guy. You go, and go to New York and you go to his office, have a little something in his office, you know, lunch or whatever, like like when they used to do with Red's office. Red had Chinese food yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah. the guys would come in. Well, were so you? That was, that was nice. And he just taught me about, you know, the whole about keeping good notes and making ledgers and being able to document whatever you spend and that type of a thing. So it was, it was nice. I always had a good time going to New York, visiting with him. How much thought? you know, process did you have going into that draft in terms of knowing who would finish where, where you might rank? Was there any indication from anybody, Coach Durham getting me on the grapevine, who was, you know, recruited, you know, who was thinking? Bob, about I don't remember ever even thinking about it. <laughs> about the draft? About being drafted? No, I don't remember even. I knew it was going to happen, but I had no control of it, so what the hell, you know, just do it. <laughs> You know, I'm so going to go some. I was, I knew I was going to go someplace, but I didn't know where. We later learned. You know, Bob will tell you. You know, I mean, that was a pretty good draft. Oh, really? we're going to get to that. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, I was, talk about the guy. Get out of here I without talking talk about, about that. that class. Who went ahead of you? Who went ahead of you in that draft? Well, there was Pete. I think Pete. No, Lanier, Pete, and Tom Janovich. I don't know if in that order and then myself. Then Sam Lacey. And. um Nate Archibald and um, Calvin Murphy were second round picks. Wow. Dan Issel and Charlie Scott went to the ABA, that class. So, um, yeah, it was a pretty good class. Eight Hall of Famers now. Rudy T was number two. Rudy T. Rudy Tomjanovich. And, was three, and right? He was he's going three. in as a coach, but he would talk, talk about him as a player for people who don't. Uh, you remember, Rudy T is a player. What do you remember? Well, you know, I. I know Rudy T really well. He and I uh, used to run a basketball camp together down in Texas, and he used to come up to my place in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, I started one with Rudy T, Doug Collins, and Phil Chenier. I was going to try to do one with Jerry Sloan. My deal was I wanted to have a basketball camp in every NBA city. Whoa. So run them, like have a front office, and then farm everything out, you know. Um, but that, that became a heck of, heck of a lot of work for me, you know, and I said, oh, I can't do this. So, and, and so anyway, um, so I know Rudy from spending time with him in the summer and, you know, socializing. And um, so I'm biased in my opinion about Rudy, but I, I mean, he was a hell of a player. He wasn't, he wasn't the kind of guy like um, Bird that had that handle that he could do thing that was creative along the way. He was a straight line guy, but man, could he fill it up. I mean, Thanks he could always shoot it. He could make shots around the rim, you know, didn't matter. He was, he was a hell of a player, but he had range, you know, before big guys like him. He's a big, he's my size. He had big guy. He had range. Yeah. And he's that bank shot from probably 20 feet away sometimes. I think he's the longest bank shooter ever. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, there were other bank shooters. Sam Jones. He was, was good at it. Oh, he was awesome at it. All right, Dave, a couple weeks I ago. I didn't see talking. Sam Jones play. They told me he, he was a bank shot guy. He was a bank shot guy, but not from that distance. He was a mid-range. He was a 15, 17, you know, 15 foot. Rudy T would, I swear, to be three, some of them today. No question. I mean, it was a bank shot. Let's do it anyway. Duncan was a bank shooter, but not, you know, same thing, 15, 13, 14, you know, on low box, turn around, bank shoot. Rudy T was amazing in that way. All right, a couple weeks ago, you and I, would, I uh, we were talking – uh, about this class and your uh, of, of 70 with the eight Hall of Famers and other good players in there, including Jeff Petrie. We'll get to that point in a minute. But uh, 
And I said, let's put this team on the floor. Okay. Let's put this team of eight guy Hall of Famers on the floor. And I said, well, you got Lanier at center and you could be the power forward. And I thought you're going to jump through the phone and, and, and hit me because uh, you don't want any part of being view viewed as a forward, do you? Ever. No, what I tell you, I said, well, you know, Bob Lanier could play power forward. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about being a center and what it mean, what being a center always meant to you. You know, then you think about Issel, you know, the skills that he had. And um, so, you know, it's pretty good, uh, pretty good group of guys with good skills. Right. Um, hold on one second. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, what was the question? I Center forgot. position. I the stuff huh? you you want to be, you know, you want to be regarded. I know we wanted to be at the time, and you were still as a center. And that position is being devalued today. The five man is is not important as much in the NBA anymore. But and you're, you know, it was vitally important to you to be a center. Well, I think that you know they said you were the center because you were in the middle of everything, and a lot of times the ball went inside. You made better. The passes came from the post area, the the elbow area, and the top of the key. So. You know, in Red's plays, the six plays. Yes. The one center handled the ball. The two, the center set a pick. The three, the center handled the ball. The four, the six. I don't know if the five did. And then in our spread offense, the center was out there all the time. Yeah. So that's how centers were used differently then than today. There was more of a skill set because they all had hook shots. They all had little jumpers. You know, they had a backup game and stuff like that. Could protect the rim and all, but they could shoot as well. And most of them were pretty good free throw shooters, as a matter of fact, if I recall. You know, no real clunkers like they have today with some of these guys. I didn't, I didn't but, you know, most – I mean, I wouldn't want to play against these guys today. They're just too damn big and strong. I mean, the velocity, now they're going so fast and they're so much bigger and so much big, just well-conditioned because they're all – you know, they train like the guy in the Rocky film, you know what I mean? It's like, it's nuts. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's, it's a lot of contact, even though they say it's not as rough. I, but, but Dave, to play nowadays. the two things that I think have been lost, and maybe not lost, because some guys have them, but, but number one is the skill. And, and number two, well, I don't know that they don't have the skill. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying they don't have the skill. The problem is, is that they don't get a chance are not encouraged to do it because of the, the way they've um, made the game played is that the coach is telling them, and it's ingrained in their head now since forever, the best shot is a three-point shot. So you're just – your shot is a dispensable kind of a thing. It's okay. You know, we need it sometimes, and most of the time <laughs> we're hoping you get double team, and that's why we want you to get really good because we really want a double team so we can kick it out to our shooters. Yeah. That's the philosophy of the game, open it up. And, you know, I mean, how many – off a penetration, how many passes result in a three as opposed to a two or a layup? Yeah. I would say a, a heavy percentage ends up being a three-point effort, either the first one out or the second one or the third one. But it becomes a perimeter passing game or skip pass game. But it's always a somebody behind the arc now. So that's why they devalued it. And that's why in the beginning, I didn't like the three-point play. Very beginning, I said, I don't, I don't like this. First of all, I don't never get to shoot them. So why would I, you know, and, and if you work at something hard enough, you're going to get decent at it. I mean, it's not a hard shot. Most of the time, you're wide open. So it's not that hard, really, if you develop a groove on it. But it's like, no, you know, why is that three-point play? more important than my hook shot over Jabbar. We're going to have a swimming, you know, diving meet. We're going to grade the shot now. I mean, you know, that's not right, you know, and as far as the degree of difficulty. So um, I said, so it's okay. Let's just use it. I understand the deal. You want to keep people in the seats and blah, blah, blah. It's out of range. You want to, you know, have keep the interest of the fan. I get it. Okay. I said, so play the game using the two all the way up to the beginning of the fourth period. Just play a fourth period, put the three-point play in. That's it. Yeah. Because now it's a specialty shot. That's what you, you know, you, so that's what it was. I think they, if they did it today, it'd be good. Because then the rest of the game, they'd be trying to attack the basket. Because the two would be the highest percentage shot. 
just makes sense. And the numbers are numbers. That's what Ira Levy taught me. Numbers are numbers. <laughs> just a game, Cowens. <laughs> you remember, uh, uh, it came in in 79-80, your last year with the Celtics. Right. And, and the, do you remember how you know, the coach was pitching? Anybody talking about, you know, was, you know what, what was the philosophy? Did anybody even talk about how, you know, how often you should use it or what to do with it? I mean, the first well, several if you years. just look at the stats, even when I coached, there was – and I was in the mid '90s, and you know all that. That was, you still weren't using it very much all that time. It took it. It took 20 years for that thing to sort of get get hot. And I think Daryl Morey is the guy that finally convinced everybody, you know, the way to go with, with the uh, and and put the phrase in mode. You mean that troublemaker? You mean that troublemaker down there in Texas? That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. He's the old, hey, I tell you what, he showed some moxie, and. And I was, I was, you know, interested to see that, you know, once that happened, mm -hmm. you never heard anything from him again. No, you didn't. Oh, no, we he haven't. Very quiet about everything. And that's smart. That was smart on his part. Well, I'm sure the commissioner and him had a, he had, had a conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure about that. Because, but, I mean, if you think about it, you, you care about the human race of the marketplace. Yeah. You know, that's the kind of decision it is. And you got to, you know, you got to play that one in the middle a little bit. Been on the stakes. You so, mentioned coaching, and and you did coach extensively in the in the NBA, included, and also in the uh, a, a year or so in, in the with the women. But my question is this, Dave: uh, did the CBA too? The CBA. Oh yes, that's right. The Worcester. Worcester. Yes. Um, the, as a player, the difference between playing and coaching, with regard to the winning and losing feeling, uh, as a coach, uh, what was more the greater sensation? Uh, hating to lose or, or satisfaction in winning? Uh, not have to, <laughs> it's kind of not have to talk bad. Um, it, you're glad you, you didn't have to talk bad about some of your best players to the, to the press. <laughs> you have to hold those things in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll buy you that. You know, after the game, you after the game, you say, "Oh yeah, we tried. We all, we, you know, we really suck." Blah blah blah. <laughs> you can't really say that. You can't run a player down. You got to be real diplomatic. So that's the best part of winning as a coach. But you don't have to do that. Got to be way more diplomatic these days than than, than back then. Uh -huh. Trust me, these these guys now are are more thin skinned than ever. Um, uh -huh. when you're going out, uh, well, you know, you don't want to run anybody down because it's. You know, as most of the time, guys, you know, you you really know that they're trying hard, you know. Um, but um, again, you always got to dance around the issue that somebody didn't do this or maybe you didn't. You know what I mean? It's always about the negative, you know. And when you win, it's about the positive. When you were when you were going out, Larry Bird was a, a rookie or towards the end of your career. Right. How quickly did it take you? to realize Larry was going to be Larry in the NBA in, in that rookie year for him? Oh, a couple of days. That's it. Yeah. You knew right away. Huh? Was it something he did? Well, you know, I mean, I wasn't thinking about him like he was a movie star or something, but I was just saying just <laughs> as a basketball player, you know, um, you knew that it was going to just get better. First of all, he liked the game. He played hard. He practiced hard. He trained. He took took it serious. You could tell for a guy to be able to achieve what he achieved. And then, but he was. Um, I think he just tried to fit in. But Larry is a he's a has a leadership mentality. I mean, he approaches a lot of things. A lot like Michael Jordan. A lot like a lot of guys that are on that level, you know. And he had that at a young age, and that was his thing, you know. And so you could see that in him. He was not afraid of, you know, being the guy. So it was good. But that rookie year, he, did he have that swagger from day one that he that he? Well, was, it was it was um yeah it was a it was a confidence. It was just a, this is my approach. This is what I bring to the game, and he just lays it out there all the time. And you could tell the guy, you know, was an accomplished player. The way he handled the ball, and decisions he made. So you just play with a guy a couple of times. You see how they move without the ball. You see if they're aggressive. You bang them. What they do. But so it only takes a you know. You got to play against them a little bit, feel them, and um, you could tell he, the quickness, his reaction. That's what he did so good. You know, he was so quick. He, had, he really made quick decisions because he was 
little bit ahead on a lot of things because he was paying attention. He was so into it and involved. That rookie year, though, uh, he made it. I, I know he told me uh, he, he still thought you were the leader and you were the guy who should take the last shot. He, he, he did defer. I don't know if it was ever any conversation that he had with anybody, with, with you or anyone else. No. No, the, only time I, the only time I say anything to Larry, I didn't care about all that shit. I played with Havlicek and JoJo and all these. What's it, I mean, you know, who cares? You know, just whatever happens, a long season, a lot, you know what I mean? But um, the only thing I said to Larry one time is that um, I would always line up on the free throws when uh, the other team was shooting a free throw. I'd be on with the big guy, all right? And Larry usually would have a guard or somebody. A lot of times they'd put a little guard in on that one spot in, be in between on the free throw attempts, you know? So I'm, I'm getting things up. I'm blocking my guy out, ready to get it. And Larry comes from that side of the rim over there on my side. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I said, listen, I'm working my ass off for this rebound. You can't just come in here and get one in front of me because you got nobody. So if you want to do it that way, you guard this guy. You always get the big guy, and I'll go over there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Havlicek. And, of course, um, we're about a year into John's passing. And um, I am disturbed that I think he's falling – a little bit between through the cracks of history when they talk about the ultra truly great players. Uh, I, 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 and I'm, it disturbs me. People are starting are not unaware now how great John Havlicek was. Could you just, just talk a little bit about, you know, what it was like to be his teammate? Well, I don't, I don't know who's, who's asking who's, I mean, people it's, you know, they talk I mean, about you're in the business. You, top you, 15, you, you, um, you know, I mean, to me, at the end, he was every bit as good as Weston Roberts in the last five years of, of all their careers. He was as good. As, he guarded both of them. He, they guard. I mean, I'm just saying, he, he's on that level. To me, when you're going to talk Oscar Roberts and Jerry West, you got to talk John Havlicek, and people don't. That's all I'm saying. Well, let me ask you a question. So describe how John Havlicek scored all those points. Tell me, tell me what he did to be able to score all those points. Well, he did it. He moved without the ball. So that, that's one thing he did. Oh, but they weren't all layups. They were, what oh, was my God, no. Oh, of course not. He would have been, been a three-point shooter today. Easy. Easy. He would have he would, he, – well, he had that range, and, and he would have made – he would have been a, a devastating. Oh, you know, and he ran the floor better than most people. Ran it relentlessly, and he, and he, he, he worked to get open. And he came off picks. He came off – you know, he could get shots off, any, you know, anytime he needed to. But you think of his style. He was um, – he, he made – he was he was a shot he was a shot maker mm -hmm. you know what i mean and um okay. so he could be off balance he'd be leaning in and be doing something you know he had he had that kind of game too he didn't have to just be all set up like for me if i was set up nice and fundamental i had a good chance of making it mm -hmm. you had me drifting and all that stuff i probably wouldn't even be that good john wasn't like that he could make that adjustment in the air Really good shooters can score. Remember that shot in, this, in triple overtime that tied the game? The, oh, that, yeah. I mean, that, that, that leaning banker. I, it was like a Nolan Ryan fastball off the glass anyway. Yeah, it was I mean, about leaning, eight, but My God, you know, this oh, is exactly what you're talking but about. To, but to be able to touch it up like that, like right. he touched it up. How about when he, was, when he used to bank down the middle, coming down on the – he bank – I never saw anybody as, as frequently as John did bank down the middle from about 12, 15 feet. Thirteen, right? In, inside I remember the, the, the time in that the double middle. overtime he, we played in Boston against Milwaukee. Made that teardropper over no. Jabbar. Went kind no. of, Jabbar right. really challenged it. He went just at the last second, threw it up high. And then he had the one. He came down on a break and hit the rim. It came back at him, and he put he, it back in. Exactly. You were at 100%. Yeah. You know, so he was one of those kind of guys that he was, you know, you had to pay attention to him all the time. Because, like you say, he moved without the ball. You know what was a good matchup? It was him and Bradley. It was yeah. always a good matchup. Because they were kind of the same milk, just Bradley wasn't as good as John. Well, there's a story behind The story goes with that one that you may or may not know. But uh, John told me this story that Tommy Heinsohn one day, in the height of that, said to him, John, the next time Bradley puts two hands on your hips, I want you to take the ball and smash it in his face. And John said, but Hawk, as you know, that was Tommy's nickname on the team. But Hawk doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that story. But I know what a mutual admirer. John, Bill Bradley 
you know, would be a really uh, utterly, completely respected John. Just love playing against John. Oh, yeah. I mean, there were two, two peas in a pod the way they played the game, you know. I think the, John had – Bill never really was a good driver with the ball. Bill was a good setup. He was more of a Rick Mount type of a player. Okay, yeah. You know, yeah. in terms of scoring, how he used to score. Dave, you, yeah. you won so much in your career. You had that one year – didn't you guys have that one year, 70 – 77, 78, when you guys weren't very good, um, before you kind of got Larry in there. Um, what was that like for you? you? Who was the coach? I can't remember. That's right. You coached thought, uh, who was the year before? That was the year <laughs> yeah. before you took over. As, as, yeah, what, what was that whole year and a half like or two years? You know, you're losing, then you take over your player coach, and you don't see any of that anymore, player coach. It couldn't have been well, easy. I was the last one to do it. Is that right? Yeah. You know, I don't think anyone's done since. There's a good reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined it for everybody? Uh, and nobody wants that job. You don't want that job, believe me. It makes no did sense. Paid, hey, did you it get paid a no lot sense. more for doing both? No, I didn't do both. Uh, for, I got no raise. I ain't no bonus or anything. <laughs> That's I a bad agent. Dave, huh? you needed a better agent. I took it on the chin. Yeah. What for was the good of, you know. What Red used to say, it's all about family and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, you fell for it. Well, hey, I, I, was asking I, you, I believed in it. I was asking you earlier about where you were on draft day, but uh, there's another story I want to hear. Uh, How would you find out you were the MVP in the 1972-73 season? Um, after, after some game, they brought a ball into the locker room, and um, I think that's when they told everybody that they sort of made that announcement in the locker room. And so they had a basketball, and they put some tape on it and said MVP. And I, <laughs> very that formal, huh? That was it. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> what did it mean? Did it mean? I mean, did it mean a ton to you, like it does to these guys now, or, or it was just all right, move on? No, it meant it meant a lot to me because the press had nothing to do with it. It was all about the players and the coaches voting on that one. So hey, 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 watch it. No, that's the way, that's the way, that's the meaningful way. When your peers vote for you, that's a big thing. <laughs> did, uh, did you watch episode one of The Last Dance? And what was your impression? You, I, I, I liked it, you know. I, I got so much respect for guys that can play to that level on a consistent basis and just do it and do it. Take the challenge night in and night out and uh, basically overachieve, you know, for the most part all the time. So. My hat's off to, to him. I say him, like, Jesus, how about that team, though? I mean, hell, they could have won a championship without Jordan, maybe. I mean, they were pretty damn good. <clears throat> well, they almost did, you know. Yeah, yeah I know. I mean, so I, they had a – They uh, came real close that year and against the Knicks, and it was one, it was one bad call by Hugh Hollins that, that took a game away from the Bulls in Madison Square Garden, or else they may have gone on to beat. They would have played the, uh, the Rockets that year in the 94. They, would, they won 55 games without him that year. And yeah, see? Best coaching job. Uh, um, you like that one play. bad call that Mad made against the Knicks in uh, 73 when we were in the playoffs. With this them. one? It went Easter Sunday, and it was a double overtime game down there. And they called Nelly. We had the lead, and they called Nelly. We're taking out of bounds with the lead, and Nelly – takes one and a half steps up the sideline and Madden calls him for a violation. Mm -hmm. Having a problem getting the ball in because Frazier was putting some pressure on. Yeah. And, he, and then they get the ball Then They score overtime, overtime, we lose. Oh, so yeah. I can feel his pain right there. I know he's <laughs> talking about hey, You mentioned Don Nelson. Uh, people today, uh, Don Nelson led the league in field goal percentage at age 35 in 1974-75. And 90% of them, as you well know, were 15-foot jump shots, foul line jump shots, 17-foot. Uh, just, you know, Nelly as a – well, it's a player and as a character. Tell, how about Nelly? Well, you know, Nelly uh, said that when he grew up, he played in, 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 on a farm. He lived on a farm in Iowa, right? And he said where the basket was, it was right in the area where the chickens roamed around. He said, so I always had that crap on my hands, so that's why I used to stick them because oh, it was so familiar. <laughs> I did not. That's a story I didn't know from Nelly. But folks, what people Dave's alluding to, he he was notorious. He had this uh, substance that he would hide, stick him, it's called stick him, and uh, or under his shorts, 
And he they once did a pictorial a essay in the New York Post, I think, Nelly, Nelly then had to find a new hiding place for the stickum, but the stickum enabled him to have the greatest up fake in the league, right? Oh yeah, he had big hands anyway. <laughs> he had those wide, that wide span, and um, and he'd always get them with the. He really had a good one like that. Real, the whole thing was good, you know, and he get guys going for that all. The I time. remember I saw his, a whole, game. Thing, his whole thing was kind of like that. That's how he shot. You can see throw, they, jump shots. You would legitimately see him put the stickum on before games. No, no, it was, an, it was a consistent thing. So what they do is he would put the gauze around his wrist yeah. and put one thing of tape, then he put some goop on it, then he put another couple pieces, and so it would just ooze through the holes of the tape. The tape's porous. So it would just be like a – and so it would get kind of brown looking, pick up dirt and stuff like that. So then he had one – you know, we wore the short shorts, so he had one – he had tape, the whole thing under the – the, the edge of his trunks and he did the same thing so he could go and if you see him all the time he's going like this he's got his trunks and then somebody ratted on him because it was illegal so then he put it on the side of his shoe the instep of his shoe you know so he could do you know but then he had to bend way down he didn't like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 your boy your boy Paul Silas got to it he, he was using it too a lot I didn't know yeah yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He, Paul's always going. Paul's always going like that. What do you think he's doing? <laughs> I saw <laughs> Nelly in the 1969 huh? finals against the Lakers. He he did an up fake at the end of a of a break, and whoever the Laker was went sailing right off into the court, right, right literally into the first row. <laughs> The other one, you may remember this one. One night, he did the up fake to Dwight Davis of the Rockets, and he slapped the backboard. <laughs> As Who Nelly did Dwight Davis? Ball. Yeah, Dwight Davis slapped the backboard. Now, <laughs> when he came down, now he laid the ball in. Oh, yeah, there's nobody – you can't even – how can anybody today relate to him? Because there's nothing yeah. like that. There's nothing. No, he was – he was – He. I always said, you know, the game's going in 78 RPMs and he's at 45. Well, I know one he, thing. He just, he lead, he just spit in the grooves, you know. Everybody run past and all of a sudden here comes Nelly right there, boom, wide and, open. Hey, trailer on the break. You were a trailer on the break, too. Oh, yeah. that, that, that art, that, that's gone. That's, that's an you know, art. That's a, the organized part. That's nice because then you can pass. You're like a one dribble to the basket. It's a nice place to get it. You know, uh, you know Nelly, I mean, here's the thing about Nelly, too. I, I, when the lead would go like from 10 to 2, we call timeout. That was a time for run a 14 play for Nelly. I can remember you guys run. And, and then it came up. Remember Tommy came up with the 15 with a triple pick? Remember that play? I don't. Yeah, it was a triple pick. You were to come down. You were the last one to come down from the top. Oh, okay. I get it. You know, yeah, yeah. you had you set up for the one. Oh, I dribbled the ball down. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, yeah, and then you set the pick. It was a triple pick. You go in and come off. And I can still see a guy named, oh, what was his name? Don Ford for the Lakers. And flailing, trying to get through one night. It was like a pathetic thing. It was overwhelmed by three guys. I mean, it was, God, it was just such a different game, the nature so, of it. So go right from what you just described of on the trailer. You come down, you get the ball at 18 feet, and you have the luxury of your if you're open, or you give them the Nelly thing and you drive, and then you try to make a play. What would happen today? The coach would say, "Don't take that shot. Stop at the three-point line and take." Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So for that extra five feet or four or five feet difference, they're going to go to that that stat, and no so way. that's you say what's changed. That right there. So that would take away any kind of going to the basket by a big guy. Another skill, you know, that if, if you did it all the time, these guys today, as I said before, they'd be able to do all those things really well. But they'd be encouraged to do it. They would practice it in game situation, you know, one thing. But they've never been able to do that. Because which was a double exchange of, of either guard or forward and, and at the, the center at the top. And then later on, you, you had the variation, the one R, reverse, right? And then it was ultimately the one New York, the, the, the lob to you, you know? And, That's and, right. And, you know, but it was all set up in the first quarter, setting things up so you could run this counterplay in the fourth quarter. I that, don't, was, I, that was the most – Anybody um, do anything like this anymore? That was like an equal opportunity play because – you know, you always say you could, you had a one play, 
but then if you wanted to use John in it as opposed to um, Don Cheney and Jojo White, then you would say, okay, we'll put John in there for Cheney and put him over. So you could do the whole, right. uh, you know, the one, the one R, the one C, the one New York, the one AR, the one C, you know, all these different combinations. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. But I mean, but I mean, I got to learn all this watching you guys, but, yeah. but you know, setting people up for the fourth quarter. And I just love it. And, and, you know, when guys. There was a lot of moving right. without the ball to get a yeah, setup for a particular you know? shot. Yeah, I know, I don't know. It was, it was right. Yeah, it was just different. And, and then the thing that I miss the most, Bob, is the um, the contrast between the coaches and their systems. Like you know, you had John Wooden had the UCLA thing. You had Dick Mata had the oh the Bulls had the um, Hawk play and his whole set on the the guy getting the ball at the elbow. And then you know, then you had some of that mid guys had it in the middle and so you know everybody would come up with sort of different systems now it's all middle pick and roll it's just pick and roll after pick and roll that's what it is I mean and that's what everybody does so they want to get isolation they want to get the the floor spread makes it easy like Archie Clark said man I wish I had seen that much court ahead of me when I had it I've been making a living at the basket you know but when we played it was all scrunched in so the it really discouraged dribbling more than, and then, you know, passing was the thing. You I mentioned think. those Bulls teams. Uh, that One I, thing leads to the other. The three-pointer did all that. It spread it out, more dribbling, more jumping in the air, more turning around, more all this mm-hmm. stuff. And so it gets acrobatic, and I think the fans like it. So it's been good in terms of fan interest. Yeah. I think the betters can bet on it now. It's getting consistent so that, you know, that keeps their interest. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> you know it makes it well it makes a different thing i mean i mean without betting i don't think sports would be all that popular to tell you the truth wow. that's my opinion i mean there's there's guys that love the competition but most people who live on the east don't, don't care about oregon playing washington unless they got some money on the game <laughs> so that just keeps everything you know churning and yep. you know works on itself but i know i if you know people, bartenders, there's a lot of people like to wager, you know, in social settings, just the way it is. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I before before Nothing we let you go, yeah. I mean, that's a big industry. Look at look at Vegas right now. Oh, yeah. You know, what's going on? It's terrible. Yeah. Give, give us your, your favorite red story before we let you go. You, you kind of, you guys mentioned the Chinese food that was always in his office. Uh, I guess. When well, he had the luncheons. He always had the luncheons. And he'd have Sam Kane in there or, or – um, Jack Satter or somebody like that, they'd be in there and he's holding court, you know, smoking a cigar with his letter openers and some deli sandwiches and coleslaw and pickles, you know, and him, him drinking probably what a diet Coke. What did he drink? Yeah. He wasn't a drinker. Oh, just Coca-Cola with Pepsi Cola. Yeah. yeah. No coffee ever. Never, never ate eggs. He said, I never had an egg. I go, well, Chinese food got a lot of eggs in it. Really. <laughs> he, didn't, he, he didn't like like a, a soft right. boiled egg or a fried egg or a scrambled egg, you know. But um, he was he was nice um, when Debbie was pregnant and she went to one of the practices. Um, he'd bring her over some lox and bagels and stuff like that. You know, it was good that way. You oh, know, that's how red was. He was always thinking. You know the story supposedly that uh, he went to scout you playing uh, your senior year at Dayton, and he after about a half a first half he walks out and, and and looking like he was unhappy, trying to con everybody into thinking that he wasn't interested in you. I don't know if you heard that story, but that was one. Oh yeah, I've heard it a lot, Bob. Yeah, I, mean, that, I don't think it was true. I don't think <laughs> that affected anybody's opinion. <laughs> but I know that's what Koozie said. Koozie had number five pick. Oh God! And he was at Cincinnati, so that's my hometown. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was. But to tell you a story about Red, you ask about Red, and um, so when my father uh, had heard that he, the doctor stopped working on him, he said, "Jack, we've been keeping you alive long. <laughs> we can't do no more for you." So I thought Red was in the hospital at the time himself. I think Red's a couple of years older than my dad, and so I called Red and I said, "How you doing?" You know, and blah blah blah. And I said, "Red, how come?" I said, "What's wrong?" He said, "Everything." <laughs> <laughs> so I asked him to call my dad because they had a nice relationship, and I told him the news. And Red, I gave him the number, and Red called my father. 
that they talk about, you know, getting close to dying and all that stuff. Yeah. So that, that's the kind of, that's what I remember about Red. That's nice. Other than that, he didn't pay me very well. But other than that, <laughs> I guess I didn't ask him right. I don't. What was your contract? When you first got in the league, do you remember what you made a year? Oh, I made uh, about $15 a minute. <laughs> I don't know how many minutes you played, so yeah, add that up for me. What, what was it per year? Per year, ninety. It was um, uh, ninety grand, which was a ton of money back then, right? Ninety grand. I mean, it was for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm 21 years old. That's pretty good. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and your last, your last contract. You remember what it was? Uh, it was it was north of there. <laughs> I hope. I hope it was North. It took a while. I mean, it took a while. MVP. Everybody signed these like three-year deals, you know, like you know, in the Pippen thing. They were talking about how he signed such a long-term deal, and now he was all upset at the end. But I guess Reinsdorf was one of those guys that said, "That's it. This is my rule: hard, fast rule. The deal's a deal's a deal." You know, he didn't want to open that gate. You know, renegotiations. Red would have said the same thing, don't you think? That's the way Red thought. I don't think there's any question about that. Well, well, yeah, he'd renegotiate if he wanted to. Not if you wanted to, but if he wanted to. <laughs> yeah. If he wanted to add another year on your contract at a good price, you know, he'd say, yeah, let's talk about something. I know the one that he hated incentives. He didn't want to hear about it. if you make the all-star team. You get, he said, if I, for what I'm paying you, you better make the all-star team, right? Oh, that's right. That's the yeah. <laughs> All right, well, listen, we, we really appreciate you jumping on, Dave. Uh, this is fun. This was a blast for me. and. Uh, I know for you guys, I can listen to this all day and the story. So we'll we'll do it again. Uh, be safe. Where are you now? Are you home and where? Where are I, you? We live in Maine. You yep. do. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Bob's been up here. I have. Well, Very nice, right on the lake. Yeah, and I tell you, it's worked up today. It's worked up big time. Yeah. Well, listen. But listen, everybody, be, be well. All right. Nice to talk to y'all. Thanks a lot, Thanks, David. David. Take okay. care. Thank you. Yep. Bye bye.